All right, everybody, we'll go, go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome to the uh, first talk in the fall colloquium series in the Department of Anthropology at the University of New, New Mexico. Uh, my name is Ian Wallace, and I'm the chair of the colloquium committee this uh, semester. Um, we have 10 public talks uh, scheduled for this semester. Um, they'll all be held on Zoom at 10 a.m. on Fridays, Mountain Time, so, so this time each week. Um, and uh, they're all gonna be super great. Uh, I'm really excited about all of the talks um, and I hope that all of you can attend all of them. Um, today's speaker is really a wonderful way to get started on the uh, series. Uh, Dustin Martin is a member of the Navajo Nation and executive director of Wings of America. Uh, Wings is a Santa Fe based nonprofit organization that uses running to empower native youth and their families. Uh, Dustin is a graduate of Columbia University in New York City, uh, where he completed an NCAA Division I running career um, and graduated summa cum laude in anthropology. Um, afterwards, Dustin was really eager and happy to return to his home here in the Southwest uh, and give back to the organization Wings of America and the people and culture that have opened up many doors for him in his life. Um, I first got to know Dustin back in 2016 when I saw him speak at a conference on Native American running at Harvard University, uh, which was held a couple of days before the Boston Marathon. Um, and I was really fascinated and moved by Dustin's talk and really by the whole conference. Um, I was also really blown away uh, when a few days later I got to see Dustin run for the first time. Um, I woke up really early that morning to, uh, to go out to a particularly famous and difficult part of the Boston Marathon called Heartbreak Hill. And I wanted to go out there early so I could see all the elite runners and the, and the leaders uh, run past. And I went out there, saw some really famous, uh, wonderful runners. Uh, but one runner I did not expect to see so early in the morning was Dustin. Uh, come flying up Heartbreak Hill, uh, and I, it sort of th things sort of clicked in my head for the first time that oh my goodness, Dustin is an incredible uh, runner. Um, and uh, so yes, he's a really good runner, um, but he's also a really good person, and that's primarily why I invited him uh, here today to to talk to us. So without further ado, Dustin Martin, who uh, is going to be giving us a talk entitled. Uh, indigenous Running, Modern Opportunity Defined by Ancestral Endurance. All right. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Yat e bene, she e dasa martin dasha jene bish bacha inishle, ta chit ni bashish chin, New Yorker dasha che kia ani dasha nale, nat na joji dat na sha, chin le de shidish che. Hello, everyone. I'm very honored to be here, and thank you, Ian, for the cool intro. Um, as well as just inviting me to, to be able to share some of this history that uh, with the, I've really been able to deep dive into these last couple of months. So um, I, I appreciate it. And I think without further ado, let's, let's just get moving. Um, before we get going, if anyone has questions or things, you can go ahead and please just throw them up in the chat. Um, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end so that I can look over those or we can review those. Um, and uh, if there's you know, something kind of stream of consciousness that comes up, uh, just, like I said, just throw it in the chat and, and hopefully we can get back to it later. Um, so let me share this screen. Share that one with you guys. All right. So if anyone could just give me a thumbs up to make sure that you can see the actual presentation and not my, my presentation notes. Yep, it's perfect. All right, awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, you know, this, this presentation, uh, really I wanna focus on, like the title says, um, our ancestral endurance. And WINGS has been around since 1988 and really focused on providing opportunities to the fastest of the fast native runners of their time. Um, but more and more uh, as the days go by, I begin to understand how and that talent has been for a lifestyle um, 
a spirituality, a way of thinking about the world and approaching our landscape and our water um, that has really instilled a talent in us that perhaps we never knew as indigenous people would be so useful in a world that fetishizes uh, those that are excellent athletes, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that something like endurance running has kind of become this massive global phenomena and, and beautiful sport and way to bring people together that it has, uh, but it has always been part of who we are as indigenous people. Here is a quote, and I like these primary sources, um, that speaks about the way that running was part of who we are as people. Uh, the need to move is really part of so many of Native North Americans or South Americans are creation stories. And those stories in many cases are at their core stories of migration. Um, and of course, what do you need with that migration? You need to move, you need to be on your feet. Right. And so although this quote from uh, this self betrayals book uh, from, from the Zunis really focuses on how things became easier after uh, tools of the white man or Anglo society came in, something like a, a donkey, um, you know, there's, there's always been great pride in the fact that our ancestors had to work very hard to be who they were and to sustain the community. Um, and that's once again, kind of what I want to underline with this presentation and something that I try to underline to WINGS participants uh, is that although the prowess of and the talent of an individual um, has certainly been, like I said, fetishized or put up on this pedestal uh, by Western society, Americans and their run tradition um, really is rooted in the community, right? Um, and here you see these, these slides, this slide with a woman making piki bread, uh, and, and there's what the piki looks like, and, and that's a, a statue that I actually saw a couple of years back when there was, uh, it was a, the American Western Bronze at the Museum of, um, at, that was at, uh, that was at the Met actually, right? So this, this image of this sort of beautiful elite runner, uh, and perhaps, perhaps the most fetishized Image, imagery of native runners are those of the Hopi snake dance and this that you see in this um, statue. Uh, it, it wouldn't exist had it not been for an entire community working to support these runners, to praise them, to give them opportunity, and also, you know, to really just help get by in life. And, you know, if you think back to the olden days, just how much work it took to get down to your field off the mesas. You'd be down there before the sun got hot, right? The movement was just a part of everyday life. Um, and whether it was getting to your field before it was too hot or sitting there waiting in the shade until you get, could move home, um, it, it was part of everything that you did. And even if you were not necessarily a farmer, if you were not getting down to your field, Physical manual labor was a part of every day's, every, a person's everyday reality. You see these children just working away at this corn, a corn harvest. Um, and, you know, if you weren't running, then maybe you were helping carry water. Here's, you know, the famous path up uh, Hawaku, Acoma Pueblo. Um, and, you know, just just moving. That's, that's the real point that I want to make is that... Um, People today, they talk about, well, how many steps did you say that doctors recommend people need to get in between 10,000 and 15,000 steps a day? And if you look uh, at how many steps a person walks per mile, which is about 2,000, that's, that's a lot uh, to think that we which should be walking or moving five, six, seven miles a day to, to maintain a healthy lifestyle, to maintain a healthy body. Um, it, it feels almost unrealistic, but that's because the way that we live has changed. And, but this way of living and this way of uh, subsistence uh, is, is deeply rooted in our, in our genetics and our DNA and, and our, our oral history as well. Here's a couple of other photos that I just really like to share and, and give people an idea, especially our youth, that I get when I give a presentation similar to this to just how much work there was to be done and thinking, you know, looking at all those 
those stalks of corn, those ears of corn, and thinking about how many trips down off the mesa that would be, or back and forth that was. Um, and so, you know, maybe every single one of those corn kernels is also a footstep as well. Now, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have to, I think, I'm preaching to the choir in, in this case with the anthropological community. Um, and and you, I imagine many people are well aware of these ancestral pathways and the diverse network of roads that was in place um, that, you know, to, to think that, okay, there are still these lines, these, and, and in, in, in South America, you know, very much roadways uh, still there in place uh, that, that exist, that were used uh, day in and day out. Um, and so to think, okay, well, a society supported these roadways, supported these uh, transitory systems, right? Think of all of those different roadways and paths that people knew that were not necessarily official Incan roads, so to speak, um, or that, you know, were so well used that there were steps uh, divided into the sandstone. Um, but I, I had the opportunity a couple years back uh, to hike the Inca Trail um, from the Sacred Valley to to Machu Picchu, um, and you know the entire way it was really underlined to me again and again that that these were roads for runners, these were roads for messengers, uh, and, it, and it made me proud as an indigenous runner to tear a, a space and share uh, a route that at one point you know maybe maybe I would have been good enough to be at, at a, an Incan messenger runner that carried kipu. Uh, maybe not, but um, it, it's pretty amazing that now things that people see as hikes or as recreation uh, really was a functional pathway, something that needed for, for society and for communication. Here in New Mexico, you know, we have, have these paths and uh, I like to really think about how, what an intimate knowledge of our landscape, um, these pathways really instilled in people. And, and as you grew up and as you travel these landscapes, uh, what it required of you, uh, here is kind of a superimposed map of the path across El Mal Pais um, from you know, uh, the Zuni Mountains across over towards Acoma. And if anyone has ever been out there hiking, there's actually still a modern, is the Zuni Acoma Trail that, that crosses the lava flow there. Uh, but if you didn't know where you were going, it, it was, it really was El Mal Pais, the bad lines. You, you could easily get lost in that landscape and never make your way out. Um, and, you know, when you see a path like this, it really makes you understand just how integral movement over the land was um, and everybody's mindset and that it was uh, commonplace for people to be migrating from village to village or from region to region and using natural landscapes and um, more so landmarks is what I meant to say, uh, to navigate their way and, and know where they were, who they were, um, and also, as I'll talk a little bit more about, you know, pray for their people and the future of, of their society. Pause for a second there. Uh, here, here are some photos, like I said, talking about that, that prayer. Um, those Zuni runners there, are, they, they engaged in a game called the Zuni Kickstick Game. Um, which apparently has not been played in Zuni for a number of years now. Um, and I actually did this presentation, uh, it must have been back in January at Zuni, and they were talking about reviving this tradition of the kickstick race, um, where, where people take that stick, uh, similar to the Arueta or Rarahipuri of the Tadamahara today, uh, you know, running in bare feet, kicking that stick out in front of you with a team of other runners. Uh, I imagine there that those two groups, each with their you know distinct painting patterns, were probably two separate teams. As you can see, each of those runners has a stick. Uh, but but these these games, so to speak, um, this recreation was also a form of prayer, right? And the photo you see there on the left, I imagine, is uh, at a, you know turn of the century photo of a prayer runner maybe returning from a spring headed back into the village, probably at Hopi, since it seems that most of these vintage photos end up being Hopi or Zuni, um, to, to, to bring prayers to the community, to bring prayers to the chief and the Kiva, um, and, 
and to to bring health and wellness to their community. They they really counted on these runners as a way to to move messages and to transmit prayers in a way that that took care of everybody. And not only that, but running has always been something that's fun. Um, I'm not entirely sure where this photo was taken. Um, I found this on online, but it, it just you see the pure joy that's there in running uh, as well. And you know whether it was something that a young man or woman uh, took on as a way, a rite of passage or as a responsibility for their community. Uh, certainly movement and running was a way that people knew how to have fun and to play with each other for a, for a long time. But as the anthropological uh, community tends to do, you know, they, they tend to focus on the function of something. What did it do for society? How did it serve a purpose? And so, of course, we have these, these functional runners, the, the messenger runners. Uh, and there on the left, that's the Joe Cajero statue, which is in the rotunda at Indian School. Uh, today, uh, one of the revolt runners of the 1680 revolt carrying his knotted cord, uh, that cord uh, signifying the countdown uh, to the day that they broke the bells and, and were to kick the Spanish out of um, New Mexico. There uh, is a sketch I think it was Guaman Poya is his name, I, I believe, if I remember from, from my college days, who they had all of these um, accounts from the Incan, from the last Inca, uh, and there is a Chosky. The Chaskis were the uh, elite uh, royal runners of the Incan Empire, and you see him there blowing his conch shell, alerting the next runner uh, down the road that it's time for him to get ready, uh, and he has a message for him to, to carry along with him. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of, uh, focus on running's functionality and what it, what the purpose that it served, uh, begins when people start talking about either the Pueblo 80 or, you know, the Chosky's of the Incan empire. However, even as early as Coronado's arrival in New Mexico in 1540, 1542, uh, it is no, there's no doubt in my mind that there were, there was a running society and a network of runners in place that let the tribes of New Mexico and Oklahoma and modern day Texas know that these people were on their way long before they arrived. Um, and, you know, if you read these early accounts, uh, there's, there's a book that I've been kind of slowly plowing through because it's, um, it's, it's kind of dry, but it's, uh, it's early accounts of Spanish uh, Navajo and Apache encounters in modern day New Mexico and Texas. Uh, and, and again and again, you see these accounts of say, with the Spanish saying, well, we saw someone on the horizon and they ran away and we couldn't catch up to them. Um, and and uh, it is no doubt in my mind that, that they knew where people were headed and they were in some ways maybe with their running steering these forces of people. But early on, uh, one revolt that we do not hear uh, much about uh, is, the Tiwa of the, of the Rio Grande Valley near Albuquerque uh, actually kind of kicking out Coronado and, and his settlers um, in those years after 1540 to 1542. Uh, there, was, there was a village uh, near modern day Isleta uh, uh, that the, it was you know, October, November that Coronado's forces came and demanded tribute, demanded uh, blankets, and, and in some accounts say that uh, violated some of the women of that village, and uh, that that was enough. So Juan Aleman, as they're referred to in the Spanish accounts, or Zawian, I, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his name in Tiwa, um, led a revolt and, and kicked those Spanish out until, uh, as which has been a, a huge topic of discussion lately, uh, the, the Entrada of 1598, um, when um, Excuse me, let me get back to my notes there. Uh, when, when Spanish forces returned, uh, and this is a photo actually just from a couple of weeks ago, which for me was very profound. It made me understand something because uh, this is uh, Onyate toppled over. They're about to remove him, the city of Albuquerque, um, you know, decided to remove Onyate rather than let uh, the, the people take him into their own hands. Uh, and I think this is probably the most appropriate depiction of uh, 
explorer groups any place in the Americas in that time uh, with with a native guide at the front, truly at the front. Um, and whether they coerced that guide into leading them to wherever they needed to go, uh, or that person came willingly, those people were often runners, right? They, they were, were movement, moving on their feet. And as I look at uh, this particular guide, I see, you know, it, it looks like his footwear is more like Hirachi's. Maybe he was a guide from uh, the, the area in modern day um, Chihuahua, uh, the areas around Copper Canyon that, that was coerced to, to bring a forest north uh, and, and help guide them. But that's not to say that that runner or that, that man had not moved through this area many times before, uh, or at least a couple times before uh, his two explorers. Uh, and then of course we have uh, the story of the Pueblo Revolt runners. This is Gatua and Umtua of Tusuki Pueblo, uh, the martyred runners of the 1680 uh, revolt of Pueblo people. Uh, these two runners uh, were just teenage boys at the time, were sent out to dispatch messages um, in the Galisteo River Basin, Galisteo area of, around modern day Santa Fe. Uh, and, you know, the, there was a Pueblo in mo where modern day Santa Fe is called Ogopagi. Um, and unfortunately, these two young men were intercepted uh, and tortured by the Spanish governor. Uh, but at, by that point, it was too late. Even though the revolution had to be moved up, there was a, enough of a network of runners in place that they were able to send out uh, dispatch runners, let, let the people know that the revolt had to be moved forward. Um, and as many of us know, it, it was successful. And uh, that the, this was, you know, in many ways, the second Pueblo revolt um, was, you know, kicked the Spanish out of New Mexico mostly for 12 years. Uh, and after that, the Spanish wouldn't dare um, perpetrate, uh, whether it be Pueblo religion or, or Pueblo life ways in the, in the way that they had before. And I would argue in many ways that the, the canes of sovereignty that President Lincoln gave to the Pueblos uh, in, in the early 19, or sorry, in the late 1800s um, were a result of, this, of knowledge of this type of revolt and the prowess of Pueblo runners and, and the organization uh, that the tribes of the Southwest had in order to come together um, and, and, and actively and violently voice their distrust and their displeasure uh, with, with colonial rule. Now, we can continue to talk about revolt or we can continue to talk about the ways that runners change to society, but I more so like to encourage our participants and people in general to think about what it must have been like in the Southwest or any part in the Americas uh, before roads, before modern landmarks, and just imagine yourself navigating uh, the Southwest or any landscape, right, with the help of these landmarks, these, these silhouettes on the horizon ingrained in our in our memory and in some way our muscle memory. Um, and you know, this, this looks like for my, my view and my, after my own running, this, this looks like uh, just south and east of the peaks um, up near Flagstaff. Um, and you know, but settlers didn't have, have the same knowledge, right? They couldn't move so swiftly over the landscape and uh, Native runners were always privileged because of that and, and put to use and asked to carry messages um, and in many ways lauded by uh, settlers and colonial society because they were able to move across the land in ways that they couldn't comprehend, they didn't understand, right? Here's a cool photo, an early photo of uh, up, up uh, above Hamas, Soda Dam, um, you know, before there was any really road there, but just imagining what must have been in that valley uh, as a landmark and way for people to kind of funnel their movement and and know where they were know know where they were going what resources they left and looking at water levels maybe they're at soda dam as they pass by to get an indicator of what it could have been like up ahead and gradually things changed right this is a, a train 
bridge across Black Canyon near the modern day Flagstaff um, and the routes that people took and, and the way that they understood travel over land completely changed. Uh, however, the tradition of running uh, did not and, and running and runners were still continued to be uh, some, a, a group and a, and a people that were very revered in society. Um, and this is probably, I would guess, in the 40s or 50s at intertribal ceremonial and gallop. Um, but even then, just, just look at how fit these guys are. Um, it's, it's pretty astounding. And I love showing these photos to younger generations of native kids because, you know, they, they all kind of look and say, well, all right, that's, it is in, it is inside of us. That's, that's maybe what we should, we should look like if we were moving the way that our ancestors did and, you know, our, our bodies and our physique as a, as a, as evidence of our lifestyle, um, is, is very important. So I think it's very important that these historical records exist. Um, you know, here's another photo of some of these just tawny fit runners. Uh, it just, you know, always kind of boggles my mind thinking about, you know, the, the amount of distance that they covered, what, you know, what they were running on or with bare feet, sometimes the, the hot sand or just having to think about the way that they approached the day, whether they were running in the early morning or even sometimes through night. Uh, you know, I think many of us maybe have traveled across the Mojave Desert, uh, you know, that section from Kingman to basically until you get to almost LA. It's just some of the most in I've ever been through in my life. But only recently after, you know, really thinking about running and, and the use that has served for these societies that I begin to think about really looking at those, once again, silhouettes on the horizon, like they're, you know, they're, that's why they're called needles. You can see those landscapes in the background and thinking about our ancestors or ancestors from another tribe, really navigating their way through these landscapes using those um, landmarks. Unlike the, you know, things change so much when uh, people are looking for the buildings at the foot of landmarks rather than the landmarks themselves. So now getting on to this opportunity we were talking about, right? This is the tradition. This is the sort of the, the idea behind why indigenous runners and native runners in North America uh, were so strong and so um, really just, just, just amazing, right? But what, what happened from that, you know, and, and at what point did opportunity, modern opportunity really become sort of uh, commingled with indigenous running? Uh, so here's, here's a story um, of many people know as Roger Bannister or think of Roger, Roger Bannister as the first human to break the, a sub four minute mile. Uh, however, there are accounts, uh, US Calvary accounts of this Pawnee runner um, and there, there's his native name, I can't say it, pronounce it, but running not a sub four minute mile, one, twice uh, over a measured course. Um, and sometimes I feel like you have to take calorie accounts with a grain of salt. Um, however, you know, I, uh, I think it's 100% possible that there were native runners of, with the talent and, and the training uh, long before 1954 when everyone believes that Roger Bannister broke the first four minute mile where, where native runners could have been um, running that pace and, and hitting those marks long before anyone cared to actually write them down or put them in the history books. Now, here is kind of my, my favorite native runner or perhaps the most inspirational to me, Louis Tawanama um, from Second Mesa, Hopi. Um, in 1906, Louis Tomonimo was sent to boarding school, uh, first at Fort Wingate in New Mexico, and then put on a train and sent all the way to Carlisle Indian School, the, the newly in Pennsylvania, because he himself would not send his children and his village men would not send their children to boarding school. They said, so they said, fine, we'll put him on a train and send him there. Uh, and so there he was at Carlisle Indian School. This is the same time, a contemporary of Jim Thorpe. Uh, who I'll talk about in a second. Um, but I, aside from the accolades to his name, which is a silver medal in the 10,000 meter, I think what's more important for me to think about is just how much inner strength it must have taken for him 
to be essentially a prisoner of war in 1906. Uh, by 1908, competing in the London Marathon at the London Olympics uh, in, a, in a United States jersey, right? And then coming home to Theodore Roosevelt, shaking your hand, saying, thank you for making our country look so strong and proud on the international stage. Um, you know, I get, a, I get a frog in my throat just even thinking about how much, you know, really just how much self-control it must have taken to use a talent that is obviously, it was not the result of Pop Warner's training there at Carlisle Indian School that Louis Tawanima was able to compete in the London Olympics right off the bat. You know, 1906, he's there at Carlisle Indian School to begin with, and it's not like Pop Warner turned him into a world-class athlete in two years. That was his culture speaking. That was his culture uh, showing itself in his legs. Um, and in many ways, the United States government and the Indian School um, you know, they, 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 in some way weaponized that, that talent, right. And, and use it as an implement of nationalism, early United States nationalism, when at the time the United States was, was not seen as a world superpower. And, um, you know, oddly enough, the United States at these Olympic games, um, you know, with Jim Thorpe, uh, you know, winning both the decathlon and the heptathlon, at the next Olympics in Stockholm, um, you know, it, it was it was very obvious that these were some amazing athletes, and they were making the United States of America look strong and powerful. Uh, but we must recognize that this was the training um, and the knowledge of our ancestors here in North America, not necessarily, uh, or really not at all, modern sport speaking for itself. And as we go on, there are, you know, more and more runners that that first year in 2016 that Ian mentioned when Wings was invited there to uh, celebrate victories or near victories of Native runners in the Boston Marathon. I first learned of Tom Longboat uh, as 1907 Boston Marathon winner um, and competed in the 1908 Olympic Marathon alongside Louis Tawanema as well. Uh, he was also a dispatch runner um, for Canada in the uh in world war one in france um oddly enough he was so popular at the time um that a year later after 1908 he, so he actually collapsed in the london uh olympic marathon but in and the year later he won um, the marathon world championships as they called it uh around a track that was actually in madison square garden in new york city so literally tens of thousands of people would gather around during this time when the walkabout or you know feats of endurance were were wildly popular um, in in big major cities, whether it be uh, in New York City or across the pond. Um, and and Tom Longboat was so famous at the time that he was actually his identity was stolen when he went to to uh, or one and there was a con man sort of traveling around the United States using his name. Uh, to sell tickets to a concert, actually. Um, but to think, right, that a, a Native American runner um, would be so popular in the country that, that another non-Native person would assume his identity is, is pretty, um, it's entertaining to me, but it's also indicative of just how revered these, these figures are. Uh, next, we can talk about Andrew Soft Lexus Penobscot from Maine, um, you know, competed as well uh, alongside Louis Tuanima in the Stockholm Olympics in the Olympic marathon, uh, competed in 1908 as well. I was looking at, you know, these accolades, second, third in the Boston marathon um, is, is pretty amazing. Uh, and then fast forward a little bit to Ellison Tarzan Brown, Narragansett from Rhode Island, uh, winning two marathons, setting a course record in 1939. Um, and competing in the 1936 uh, Berlin Olympics. Um, many people say actually that uh, in the Berlin Olympics, he, he did not do well or had a rough go of it. And um, some say that their accounts are that he told them stories of Hitler's fascist brown shirts at the time, actually roughing him up, um, maybe in the same way that Jesse Owens was intimidated at the time. Um, saying, you know, you, you better not do well in that marathon because uh, 
our country has a, a vested interest in, in showing that your people are, are not, should not be beating our people. Uh, but that was, that was not the case. Ellison Tarzan Brown was an amazing runner. And, and if you read more into his story, you hear stories of him actually sometimes choosing which place he was getting, was going to earn in a competition, not based on just wanting to win, but knowing that the second or the third place prize is actually going to make his family more money or that he could take that item and sell it to uh, benefit his family in a way that's, that's, that, that was m better than a, a medal or whatever, a, a cup that may have been, right? Um, one uh, source that I would encourage everyone maybe to look into if you don't have her name already or his, his work is Matthew Sakiosua Gilbert, who recently um, I think is in the history department at U of A, he was in Illinois for a while, uh, has written a, a number of articles about Hopi runners in particular. Uh, he himself is Hopi. Um, and makes a very compelling argument about early Hopi runners and their contribution to, as I was saying, this, um, you know, this feeling of United States nationalism uh, and, and being able to, to be proud of our nation uh, in, some way, in some ways how perverse it was that, that they were in the, the culture and the, the talent the in many ways, the United States government had, had you know, told everyone that was worthless uh, until, you know, until you can, as we see here, Billy Mills winning gold in 1964 uh, in, in Tokyo, make, make your nation look strong and, and powerful. Uh, Billy Mills, it was Oglala Lakota, or from Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, three-time NCAA American, Right, uh, American record holder for a while in a couple of events, uh, ran alongside some of the greatest runners in history, um, and at one point had uh, the the U.S. record in um, the five mile run, and you know ran with the likes of Jerry Lindgren. Uh, here is perhaps my favorite runner, uh, um, Steve Gachupin from Jemez Pueblo, uh, and if you hear anyone from Jemez or from Zia, anyone who of those Pueblos that live around the Jemez Mountains, you'll hear about running and chasing deer, running and hunting. Um, and that, you know, that, that activity, that knowledge uh, that was ingrained by a person's culture turned into six Pikes Peak Marathon wins between 66 and 71. Uh, the first time that uh, uh, Peak Marathon he was wearing Chuck Taylors. Uh, he's, you know, I've heard this straight from his mouth that when he ran the 1968 marathon trials there, that, that photo you see down there at the bottom, uh, he had no idea that he was allowed to take water, that he could take water. Um, so, you know, to be there competing with people like Billy Mills and George Young, some of the, the greatest runners, some of the big names in, in American running history uh, is just uh, amazing, astounding that, you know, there were no necessarily modern training techniques or modern training knowledge uh but but just that cultural strength and the pride that they could bring to their community uh is what pushed them forward uh, here is another Hamas runner that followed in steve gachupin's footsteps alwaki uh two-time winner of the pikes peak marathon in 82 he set a record at the pikes peak marathon that stood for about 10 years um eight-time winner of the la Luz trail run uh his PR on the trail run is, is still the fastest ever uh, that, that's run over the modern course. So it's a nine mile course now, and that was run in 1983. Uh, and so when you see the other names that are on that all time list, people like Simon Gutierrez, some of the best mountain runners ever, you understand just how amazing Alwaki was. Uh, like, and, and, you know, so you see this photo of him winning that Empire State Building run up, uh, five time winner of that. Uh, and, and then you know, not necessarily, you know, as, as a professional runner, as, as one of the greatest hill runners ever, you would think maybe would have gone on to be a pro, pro runner, but, you know, really went on to, to take care of his landscape uh, as being a wildland firefighter. Um, and, you know, I think that's kind of as a segue, really indicative of, as I said, the mindset that indigenous runners bring to the sport. Uh, that it's it's really a way of knowing who you are, where you're from, and 
those resources, taking an inventory of those resources that are there for your people, rather than necessarily showing your dominance over another person. Uh, now, I've always had this question and, you know, I go through these slides and at one point I did this presentation and it was just like, well, where are all the women at, right? And so uh, this is more uh, a, a, um, a function of the fact that running was not a welcoming sport for women, uh, period, uh, until the mid 60s, right? And 1960, only 1960 were women allowed to compete in five running events in the Olympics, um, as opposed to the men's 16. Uh, and after 32 years of being banned, women were finally allowed to run the 800 again. Uh, but besides that, people, you know, the way that men's men runners spoke about women and running was that they were they were too weak and feeble. And here you see Jock Semple, uh, the longtime race director of the Boston Marathon, trying to push Catherine Switzer off the uh, um, off the course uh, in 1967. Uh, the previous year, Bobby Gibb banded the marathon for the first time. Um, and, you know, finally, only in 1971 did the AAU lift their ban on women competing in road races. Uh, and so from 1971, then now let's fast forward to 1978, 1981. Here, just in that quick seven, eight years, you see an indigenous woman as at, at the forefront of endurance running. Uh, Patty Dillon, Patty Dillon Catalano. Um, she was second at the Boston Marathon three times. She was the first American woman to break two and a half hours in the marathon. You know, a woman that went, in her own words, from being a, an overweight night nurse that smoked two packs of cigarettes a day to in about six years being perhaps the greatest woman runner um, of, of her age, or at least she definitely uh, had a run for it. Uh, is pretty impressive. And so, you know, I just want to underline the fact that had women been allowed to compete uh, earlier on, I, there's not a doubt in my mind that Indigenous women would have been there at the front as well. Um, and that, that talks, you know, that is included as well in our culture. Here's a, a young Navajo woman uh, engaging one of her days of running for a kennel dust ceremony. Um, and all across North America, you know, over and over, it worked with wings. I've heard uh, tribal people come to me and tell me how running is a rite of passage for them uh, and for their people and that they have their own prayer runs and that you know we still keep this tradition alive and that running is not just something that you know we we engage in just because it's become a popular sport right um, and so you know what what is this opportunity translated into what does it look like today i could sit here and talk until i'm blue in the face about all the opportunities that wings runners have earned for themselves you, there you see on the upper left my my hero from middle school and high school felicia gulliford who's from zia pueblo and then half black but she uh ran for the gallup Bengals. uh was a four-time or three-time footlocker nationals qualifier ended up running at tennessee and is today a doctor um you know down there on the lower right is our young ladies that were uh, part of the wings national team uh, no one could travel anymore we went to San Diego and uh, the wings teams captured the organization's 32nd and 33rd uh, team national title uh, since we've been going to this competition in 1988 and then down here on the left you see Kashawn Harrison uh, who just started his career running uh, for the Colorado Buffs uh, if you know anything about competitive running perennially one of the greatest uh, cross-country and track teams endurance squads in the country uh, and he was actually named Pac-12 freshman of the year last year we're very proud of him and his performance um, and just showing that uh, you know that 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 native runners still deserve to be there on the world stage uh, and that we're gonna we're still coming for those spots um, now I'd like to transition a little bit like I said I could talk to Tom blue in the face about all of the competitive uh, ways that native runners are able to distinguish themselves but one thing that has been very uh heartening and, and beautiful for me in the last few years is to to see this sort of renaissance of running as prayer um and this is just to remind people that you know the standing rock movement uh in 2016 was really it really started as a movement with bobby g three bobby jean three legs running these prayer runs uh first from cheyenne river um, up to Standing Rock, and then they decided that they were going to run to the Army Corps Engineers headquarters 
uh, I believe in Nebraska, and then we're gonna run all the way to DC. Uh, and this is what really spurred the awareness uh, nationally, internationally, uh, for um, the, the efforts and the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and, and this just continued, you know, the first prayer run, so to speak, that I participated in and with a group like this was in October slash November of 2016, uh, a young man from the Phoenix area named Riley Ortega decided that he was a Hopi young man, decided he was going to run from, from Flagstaff all the way to uh, Standing Rock. And along the way, just droves of, of tribal people from whether they were Zuni or from up, up in the Northern Plains or, uh, you know, this, this uh, run, we were here near Moab, Utah, where actually today there's another prayer run uh, put on by the Salt Lake City air protectors being run. Uh, they, they're running from Bears Ears to Salt Lake City this week, and they're going through that almost exact area where we were back in 2016. Um, and then in 2017, in December 2017, when the Trump administration announced that they were going to essentially eviscerate what, what the, new, the newly created Bears Ears National Monument and take 1.3 million acres and turn it into uh, you know, about 10% of that, uh, a group of runners really in a matter of, of a week came together, two separate groups, Hopi and Navajo, um, and then collided and decided they were gonna run from Flagstaff up to Bears Ears in prayer. Uh, praying for the future protection of our landscapes, right? And what this uh, all into is in March of 2018, uh, Sacred Strides for Healing. Uh, I, Wings and myself became uh, entangled in the organization of this run where we ran from our five respective tribal homelands. And when I say five, I mean the five tribes that put the proposal for Bears National Monument on the, press, uh, on the desk of President Obama. Uh, ran from our separate homeland. So we had a route start uh, at Santa Ana Pueblo, close here to Albuquerque. We had a route start at Zuni Pueblo. We had a route start at Flagstaff. We had a route start uh, at Hopi, as well as at Ute Mountain Ute. And over the course of a week in March 2018, we covered those 785 miles up to Bears Ears uh, and had runners join us from the Yurok tribe in California, um, from, from all over the country. Uh, and, and really kind of, as I said, uh, use running as a, as a way to exert our sovereignty and also saying that this, this is the way that we want to care for the land. This is another run that I was able to participate in along with some wings runners uh, back in, at, later in 2018 where we ran from Great Basin down to Lake Mead to really bring awareness to the fact that the Southern Nevada Water Authority was trying to uh, take groundwater from those areas and pump it down to Las Vegas to continue to develop uh, unsustainable, really living in that area where, uh, as many of us know, especially those from the Little Colorado watershed, uh, that that water has already been severely depleted um, and that those large cities in the American Southwest are not sustainable unless they are really interrupting the, the flow, the natural flow of things. Uh, this was the follow-up run to that initial Bears Ears run. Here's a route that you see us run uh, in 2019. It was about a 100-mile loop around uh, the what was Bears Ears National Monument. And what I like to underline with this is just the intimate knowledge of our landscapes that we gain through this type of prayer running. Right here you see Comb Wash and Comb Ridge. Right, and so to kind of circumnavigate around this area of, of this area, day three, you see this is the Moki Dugway that overlooks Monument Valley, uh, and then you head up this way up Cedar Mesa towards the the ears themselves, Bears Ears themselves, and then back to our kind of starting point. Um, and and you know, sadly, there's just not the same access that, or or at least in the minds of young people. Uh, in Indian country, uh, on Navajo Nation, I can more so only speak for Navajo Nation, they may see these bears ears on their horizon their whole life, uh, but to actually get up there and run through that landscape is so empowering um, and also just breeds uh, vigor for protection of these landscapes in the future. Uh, so here you see us running and carrying those prayer staffs. You see the buttes behind us there on that lower right. Um, and you know you see these runners and you see some of us with the uh, 
the chi on our faces and running in a, in a prayerful way. But, you know, at the same time, this young man, Galvin Curley, just started his D1 running career at the U of A as a wildcat. Um, some of these other runners, uh, Shamik Dubois runs for uh, UNM, uh, right? And a couple of these other runners are on the prayer run right now, headed up towards Salt Lake City. Um, so, you know, the, your role as a runner in indigenous communities is still so multifaceted, uh, this day and age. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a way that to underline that is with, you know, the activism of Jordan Marie Daniel, uh, a young woman, um, Lakota woman who ran with wings actually, uh, in 28, uh, and in, in 2019, um, when we went to the Boston Marathon, uh, she ran, mostly her and I ran to raise money for our students that you see there that travel with us to that Boston Marathon weekend and get to visit colleges and uh, spectate the marathon, participate in the 5K. Uh, but Jordan, uh, unbeknownst to us, you know, used that run and that race as a way to raise awareness for missing murdered indigenous women and people. Uh, and her, her message resonated so strongly that as you see the youth kind of absorbing this message and taking it into their own hands. They're on the right, you see Rosalie Fish. She's Cowlitz from the Northwest Coast. Uh, that's her running at her state track meet in, in Washington uh, with, with the same handprint across her face. There's a young man who's part of the Hardin Bulldogs, uh, which is Crow Country up in Montana. Uh, they're uh, at their state cross country meet last fall. They also ran uh, to try and bring awareness for this silent epidemic of missing murdered indigenous people. Um, and so just seeing running as activism is, is really inspiring. And also, like I said, shows just how multifaceted uh, the understanding of running and the use of running is in our communities. Um, and this is just to speak a little bit more about uh, the opportunities that WINGS provides uh, for, for youth. Unfortunately, this year, maybe the WINGS national team, I don't think we probably won't travel a WINGS national team. Instead, we'll look to create an incentive program for high school and early college age runners to, to log miles and, and make PRs is just probably a little too risky for us to bring a team of uh, kids from all over the place together this year. But in this photo, you see uh, a young woman here from Wind River Reservation from Wyoming. Uh, you see a, a young woman from Zuni. You see uh, uh, young ladies from Kiwa or Santa Domingo, right? So. Uh, the ability to bring tribes together with the help of running has been sort of the, the greatest privilege that I've had as a, a WINGS employee um, and as a WINGS participant in many ways. Uh, and to show, you know, the way that we can come together uh, and the way that we learn with one another. Uh, Indian country is a small place. And after we come together through running, kind of have these lifelong friendships that, you know, who knows where you'll encounter these people in the future or, or the type of advocacy work that you may do together. Um, and this is kind of where it starts for us, for WINGS, is our, our running and fitness camps and these young people that you see in the shirts with the, the compass on their shirt, uh, they're, they're our facilitators. So these are young high school, college age kids that we're then empowering to, to teach running to the next generation. And here you see D.Y. Mesa behind us uh, as we're doing camp at Zuni two summers ago. Um, and just it's so amazing uh, when kids see other young people that look and sound like them uh, and just see how fast and agile they can be. Uh, they wanna do the same. And so WINGS is gonna continue to do that. Uh, it's, it's a great honor for us to be part of this tradition um, and in some ways to continue spreading the message. Uh, and I thank you guys for your time um, and, and for your ear. And if anyone has any questions, questions, uh, please feel free. That was great, Dustin. <laughs> oh, man, you talked about getting a frog in your throat. It happened to me a few times during your talk. It was really, really uh, wonderful. Um, does anybody uh, want to uh, ask questions on chat or, or you can just jump in if you want? Um, I see Paulina address that since I, and I appreciate you asking what's the best way to support wings right now. Um, I'll be quite frank and let you know that right now wings is in an area where things are very unsure. 
um, it's, it's, this was the first summer in 25 years that Wings was not able to coordinate our summer running and fitness camps uh, because of the way that the pandemic has affected our tribal nations. Um, and I think in many ways, it might, maybe next summer might not be possible either, right? If we're really being respectful to, to the sovereignty and the safety of our, of our nations. Um, but the more that you can just share these messages, we're about to, we're, we're really about to, um, this, this weekend I'll put out the call where uh, we're, we're doing a virtual run really geared at those uh, running and fitness camp participants that weren't able to participate in our camps this last year. Uh, where we'll, they'll log miles and be able to earn incentives in exchange for their miles. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, like I said, I, I really appreciate you asking that question, but right now it's, we're kind of in a holding pattern. We're just trying to wait and understand uh, how, how comfortable or if our communities that we partner with are going to be comfortable again in the near future. And we're not trying to push that on anybody because, uh, it's is important. Also, we're also promoting um, instructional videos, things, you know, stuff for dynamic warmups and stretching. So if you want to follow us on Facebook, our Facebook is uh, at wings underscore of underscore America. Oh, excuse me. That's our Instagram. Sorry. That's our Instagram is at wings underscore of underscore America. And our, our uh, Facebook is Wings of America 1988 is the year that we were founded. Um, so please just, just keep an eye on those things and, and soon we'll be able to um, give, give more news and let people know how they may be able to contribute. And we're actually looking to move our office down to Albuquerque uh, in, the, in the near future. And so uh, as that, you know, we, we work with a lot of different communities, including Native Health Initiative and Running Medicine. I don't know if anyone here in Albuquerque is familiar with them, but uh, if, if you get out with them and, and participate in that indigenous running community that's being fostered here in Albuquerque, then you'll, you'll hear about wings and you'll hear about the next steps for us. So, so thank you. Any other questions? I'll ask a question. Um, thank you so much. This was, this was really terrific. Um, and, and I appreciate you giving us your time. Um, kind of, you know, in, in anthropology, one of our, our big areas of research has been sort of a transition to, to more and more inactivity in populations around the world. And, and do, you, do you find that this is something that your community is generally aware of? Is it a concern? Um, you know, what, what role does your organization sort of have in that broader phenomenon of of trying to promote health through activity? Absolutely, um, that's a great question. And I think, you know, we're, we're well aware of the fact that uh, inactivity has gotten us to the point where a lot of our communities are, where we're dealing with people who should be parents or looked at as grandparents or people that are ailing, right? Uh, that, that type two diabetes is ravaging, uh, you know, people that are 50 and 60 years old, and we're losing elders far too early. Uh, and Wings has always brought about that message with our kids, right? Um, we, we have always talked to them about, you know, what is dialysis, right? Maybe kids hear, oh, my, my uncle or my aunt or my grandma, they have to go to dialysis, but to actually explain to them that, at that point you have not taken care of your body for so long that you need to go to a clinic and actually have your blood filtered by a machine um, is revelatory for them and people are not necessarily explaining that to them. Fortunately, however, I will say that, you know, with Indian Health Service and with the autonomy in some ways that Indian Health Service uh, provides in a place like, especially the Navajo Nation, you do have departments like health promotion, disease prevention, which is actually, that's, that, that's the department that WINGS partners with so integrally to, to promote these programs during the summer, right? So 
special diabetes uh, initiatives like Just Move It, right? Uh, Just Move It has been around for over 30 years on the Navajo Nation, which is a free series of 5K fun run walks that's usually hosted during the summer. And we're talking hundreds of events here, right? So certainly the, these communities and, and in, in the Rio Grande Valley, there's something called Pueblo Crossroads, which Wings has also partnered with or, or helped promote, uh, where it is. It's just free opportunities to create community around movement. So people certainly expect that as a way of taking care of our communities. It's really just a matter of, of encouragement, I think, in a lot of ways. And so getting our youth, our, our, our slightly older youth out there to encourage the next generation or getting a big group to come together uh, and laugh and have fun around walking or hiking or whatever it may be uh, is is super important and you know something that wins is going to continue to engage in uh, and I think in many ways um, this most recent health crisis the pandemic has underlined once again that inactivity is is killing us right the comorbidities associated with inactivity are what we're really impacting, and this is my personal opinion, I'll, let me preface it by saying, that's what was really impacting our communities, right? Uh, and, and they'll point to lack of running water, which is part of it as well, right? They'll point to inaccess to electricity, maybe part of it, more so the fact that a lot of these elders, or not necessarily elders in many cases, were, they had congestive heart failure, there was something else, you know, they're in it, the, the, them living in a food desert for 40 years and only eating processed food, um, that's what helped COVID get them, right? It was, it was not necessarily that, you know, if, if we lived off the land, if we moved on our landscape and if we knew our, our landscapes intimately, maybe things would be different. And I hope that that's a message that we can continue to transmit um, for, for the future because I think Sadly, we had a very, very traumatic wake-up call in the last six months. Thank you so much. I have one question, um, just thinking about, uh, yeah, yeah, um, one thing that you talked about at several points that I just thought was really fascinating um, was about how running, um, how it, it, it uh, encourages people to get to know their land uh, more and just sort of their, their home more. And, and, um, and it is so true. And I think that we oftentimes think about the health benefits of running, but just, uh, just sort of the, the sort of broader community or ecological aspects to just getting out and knowing where you're from a lot more and sort of appreciating that. I found that to be just really fascinating. And I'm wondering if you see that as potentially uh, something that was also a problem that this running is helping to solve. Um, you know, whether or not people through this physical inactivity were also not necessarily having the same connection to their, their land and that this is, that this is something that is helping that. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, ac across the globe, we're having that, that issue, especially with young people who can now sit in a vehicle and tap at their phone rather than looking out the window. Right, or, or watch a, you know, their parents put on a, a movie for them when they drive across town, right? So you know, someone's uh, spatial awareness and their ability to orient themselves through their landscape is, uh, I think it's part of who we are as human beings. And the more we lose that, uh, in many ways, the less, the less human we are. And so we talk about that with, with our youth and really, try and help them take pride in and know they are and and and, and who they are and, and how that landscape dictates who they are. Right. And I mean one thing sadly that's also very relevant in Indian country is this in just the, the risks of our environment because whether it was uranium that was pulled out of the soil or a strip mine right or or all of this uh, you know the i think the term many people talk about is uh, uh environmental racism right but it's it very important for our young people to understand that these landscapes that we move over right we, even in gallup right uh, the church rock uranium spill in 1979 um you know 
for years and years, the, the state cross country meet was held at the mouth of this, you know, of, of this arroyo that was the second largest nuclear disaster in the history of Chernobyl, right? And so for us to, to cover that land and then also know those histories is, is really important, right? And, you know, even that Bears Ears run last year where we were heading up this big road that heads up the Moki Dugway, this winding, you know, dirt road, uh, that some people, you know, go up and say, wow, why is this here? Well, it's there because they, you know, the uranium companies build it so they could extract from the top of the Moki Dugway, right? Uh, and, and and so the more and more, especially in Indian country, you start moving around and really poking into the histories of the landscapes you're covering, you realize, well, you know, we've we've been screwed a lot of times, and we we got to be out there on our feet again and again so that they know that and. Uh, one way I think to to really underline that, or for me personally, when it became so obvious, is we had a camp uh, near a place called Zilsnat no Disli, uh, one of our summer running camps, uh, uh, which DZ Mesa is where, according to Dene creation stories, we emerged from the earth, right? Uh, and oddly enough, I don't know why there's some somehow there's. Uh, cell phone towers and radio towers on the top of the sacred mesa but i think more alarmingly down below right is in 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 that basin is uh with oil prices not so much now but a, a huge flurry of uh of oil and gas exploration in the last 25 years 20 years during my lifetime that uh everything has changed you know th those landscapes have changed but being in that area we were out for a run with our running and fitness camp participants. Um, and we were actually running along this natural gas pipeline. Uh, and one of these service trucks came by with a, a couple of gentlemen in it, you know, with their, their orange flag on the top and they crested the hill and, and, and were like, you get fuddled to see this big group of kids out there running. And as we passed, you know, they were friendly and waved and, you know, Afterwards, I stopped with the kids and I said, listen, what we did today, the fact that you were seen out here on your land, moving on your land, those, those men have probably never seen the people that live here before, right? They come out here and they see work opportunity, they see exploration opportunity, they see resource extraction opportunity in the same way that the Spanish conquistadores did, right? But to actually see people out on their land running covering that distance uh it completely starts to change the way that they think about the way that that land is occupied and stewarded um and and i i continue to preach that to our kids saying you know we need to be seen out there because if we're not out there taking inventory of those things and if we're not out there being seen then people are just going to think it is an empty landscape for them to project whatever they want on to it All right, if there are no other questions, we'll, we'll call it a day and let, let Dustin go. Um, thanks again so much, Dustin. That was, that was really a pleasure. And it was, it, it's, it's, we, uh, we're happy to have you part of our community here. So, so thank you very much. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate the invitation. Um, and I'm hoping I can get on, on a couple of these other uh, colloquia. Excellent. Bye-bye, everybody. See you next week. <laughs> Thanks, Dustin. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you.